Hi, this is Greg Cook, your Chem 240 instructor. Let's get started with the next video. Okay, in our second video, we're going to be talking about bonding in a little more detail. And this will cover both covalent bonding as well as ionic bonding. So when we talk about bonding, again, what we're trying to do uh, is take a look at the atoms, the atomic configurations, and look at how they can be satisfied in filling their valence shell with electrons. That can be achieved either by transferring electrons from one atom to another or by sharing those electrons in covalent bonds. So let's take a look at ionic bonding for a moment. If you look at the periodic table and take a look at the two elements I've identified here, so if you take a look at the sodium atom all the way on the left, uh, I've indicated the electron configuration there, you'll notice that in the valence shell, which is the highest energy shell that contains electrons, it only contains one electron, that's the 3s orbital. Uh, the one energy shell is filled, the second energy shell is filled, and so this is the valence shell. That's the one we're talking about in terms of reactivity. Look at chlorine all the way on the right. Notice that uh, the 1s shell is filled, the 2s and 2p energy level is filled. Now the third energy shell has a filled s orbital, but the p orbital only has five electrons. So it needs one more electron to be satisfied. Sodium has one electron that it could either uh, give up or take. So actually it's easiest for sodium to give up that electron and chlorine to take that electron. Okay, let's take a look at these two atoms in a little more detail. So you notice uh, I have shown the sodium atom with one dot and that represents the electrons in the valence shell. Uh, the filled shells, 1s2 and 2s2, 2p6, those are filled and, and uh, satisfied. But the third energy shell is uh, deficient of electrons. It's not filled. There's one unpaired electron. This uh, sodium atom can either give up or accept another electron to become filled. It's easiest for this one to give up the electron and become a positively charged atom so that you have a filled energy to energy level. On the other hand, chlorine in the valence shell has 3s2, 3p5. It's missing only one electron. So by gaining an electron, it can have a satisfied um, valence shell and become stable. So when we bring these two atoms close together, that electron is transferred from sodium to chlorine and sodium then becomes oxidized and positively charged. Chlorine becomes reduced and negatively charged. So the electron has actually been given up by the atom and given to the chlorine and those become ions, positively charged and negatively charged. Those ions attract and that electrostatic attraction between opposite charges is what we call an ionic bond. Those electrons are not shared between the atoms, they are simply associated ions. This is what many inorganic compounds or salts are made up of, are ions which are attracted to each other without sharing electrons. That's an ionic bond. Okay, and that's fine and well for the two atoms which are separated apart where one could easily give up an electron and one could easily accept an electron. However, if you think about something like carbon, look at the electron configuration of carbon. 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. In order to become stable, it has to either give up four electrons to become carbon plus four and only have one s level filled, or gain four electrons to completely fill out the rest of the p's and become a carbon minus four charge. That high amount of charge is also unstable, so carbon atoms don't like to do that. Instead, things that can't easily give up one or two electrons to become plus one, plus two, or gain uh, easily one or two electrons to become plus, minus one or minus two, tend to form shared bonds where the electrons are not given up or taken, but they form overlapping orbitals and connected shared bonds. We call these covalent bonds. It allows the atoms to achieve stable electron configurations by sharing electrons between atoms, but does not form ions, so you don't have very high concentrations of charges on a particular atom. So an electron pair that is shared between two atoms is what we call a covalent bond. Let's take a look at the simplest one, that's in hydrogen. Hydrogen atoms could give up an electron to become an H+. It does that pretty readily in a lot of different contexts, but if you take hydrogen with itself, it doesn't give up an electron to another hydrogen atom easily because a hydrogen is, uh, has a difficult time, it's a higher energy state, to take electrons. H minus, while possible, is less stable than H plus. So in order to achieve stability all around, 
hydrogen, instead of giving up and accepting electrons, will simply come together and overlap those orbitals and share those electrons. And now we have the H2 molecule. This is a shared uh, pair of electrons which we refer to as covalent bonding to form H2. Both of the hydrogen atoms at any given time have two electrons around it, so uh, they are both satisfied in terms of that stability for having the filled shell. This happens in other atoms as well. Uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, as I showed you with sodium chloride previously, they can easily accept an electron to become a negatively charged ion because it only needs one more to fill it. However, again, if you think about uh, two fluorine atoms coming together, the other fluorine doesn't easily give up an electron to become F plus because it's not stable. It still has uh, an unfilled valence shell. So instead what fluorine will do with itself is come together and share a pair of electrons so that both of them have a filled, in this case, octet uh, because it's the uh, filled energy shell of the 2s and 2p orbitals. So they all have good stable configurations. So that's why um, diatomic molecules like chlorine, bromine, fluorine, F2 um, are stable and much more stable than the atoms themselves or the ions. So in forming compounds, um, ionic bonds can be formed by gaining or losing electrons. Covalent bonds are formed by sharing electrons. And in all cases, we're trying to achieve filled energy levels to be stable. We've mentioned carbon. And since carbon has four valence electrons, it needs to get to eight valence electrons in order to be stable. So what it does is it forms four bonds. Uh, in the case of adding something like fluorine to it, you can form four bonds with fluorine, which I've indicated here on the bottom. Um, this is the uh, Lewis structure showing all the different electrons for the fluorine atoms. And you can see very clearly that um, the two electrons, one from fluorine and one from carbon, here are shared. The two electrons here are shared, the two electrons here are shared, and the two electrons here are shared. Carbon now has four bonds to four different fluorines. We can represent that structure in many different ways. Um, oftentimes we show those shared electrons or those covalent bonds just as a single line. Uh, that's a little bit easier way to draw it and to indicate it and it's important to recognize that when we draw a line or a covalent bond between two atoms it represents a shared pair of electrons. So there are two electrons in each bond that's indicated by a line. Oftentimes when we write structures for convenience we don't write all the lone pairs so it is incumbent upon you to recognize how many lone pairs a particular type of atom has. So fluorine has one covalent bond there are three lone pairs to make up the other six electrons. Oxygen typically has two bonds to something else and so there are two lone pairs making up the other four electrons that are often unwritten. Uh, we also represent chemical structures in different ways. If we had to do Lewis dot structures for all organic molecules, it would be quite tedious and difficult to draw. One way to do that is to draw what we refer to as a Kekulé structure. In a Kekulé structure, all the atoms are drawn um, and lines are represented to show the covalent bonds. And so if you think of a molecule like 2-chloro-4-methylpentane indicated here, you can see that this carbon system, I'm going to just highlight the carbon skeleton. Those are all bonded by covalent bonds, as you can see, between each of the carbons. And then each carbon has a total of four bonds. Those go to hydrogens. For example, here on the end, there are three hydrogens. The second carbon is attached to one hydrogen. Uh, this carbon in the four position is attached to a chlorine, hence the, uh, sorry, in the two position, hence the two chloro four methylpentane. Uh, and so on. But even that gets really tiring for organic chemists to draw. We can represent this also by a condensed structure. Now I find a condensed structure to be a little bit difficult to read. You have to recognize that each carbon has four bonds to it and so when you draw things in a linear fashion like this you have to know that carbon is bonded to carbon and that's bonded to carbon. You notice I have one in parentheses here. That's bonded to that carbon and that's bonded to that carbon. This one in parentheses means it's branching off of one of the carbons. And it has to be branching off of the carbon in this position because it only has one hydrogen left to make a total of four bonds. Probably a better way to represent that easier and not have to draw the bonds to hydrogen 
is to draw what I refer to as a condensed Kekulé structure, where you can see I've done a condensed structure for like CH3, but showed the covalent bonds between the carbon carbons and the carbon other atoms. Uh, so you can see clearly that this methyl group shown above is branching off of the carbon at this position. And the chlorine here is on the carbon right before it branching off of that carbon. For large complex organic molecules, this also gets to be a bit tedious and so we talk about line structures as representing the easiest way to draw organic molecules. So here you can see the line structure for this molecule and it's important to recognize that at each end and each corner or angled part there is a carbon atom. So in this case there's five carbons in a row and then one one carbon branched here. Notice other atoms are usually indicated um, like this carbon chlorine bond. This is the bond between carbon carbon and chlorine. There is no carbon at the end here that is represented by the chlorine in this line structure. Why is this important? Well, let's take a look at the next slide. Here are some other organic molecules which you can see would be a little difficult to draw any other way than by a line structure. They can be quite complex, they can have rings, they can have fused rings, they can have multiple bonds. If you were to draw all this out uh, showing every atom and every bond and every lone pair and pairs of electrons, it would be very difficult and time-consuming to draw this out and try to represent them.